Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today, we're looking at Scream 4, released in 2011 and the last film directed by Wes Craven before his death in 2015. Scream 4 is a movie that by many accounts isn't necessary. The original three films positioned themselves as an open and shut trilogy, each installment commenting on tropes in the various stages of a horror franchise. Why make a fourth film, especially 11 years after the last one? Well, because since 2000, when Scream 3 came out, many horror classics were getting rebooted and remade, and thus Scream 4 was created to comment on what happens when franchises are brought back from the dead. It also comments on series that run themselves into the ground, with the fictional Stab franchise going on seven installments at this point. Sidney, Gal, and Dewey are reunited in the place where it all began, Woodsboro, California, when a brand new slew of murders start cropping up. Rounding out the cast is a bunch of fresh young faces all eager to get killed. Speaking of which, let's get to them! The movie begins as many of the others do, with a phone call. Sleepover pals Trudy and Sherry get harassed by our old pal Ghostface after chatting about the current state of the horror genre. It sucks. It's not scary. It's gross. I hate all that torture porn shit. In no time at all, literally less than four minutes in, they get killed. Ghostface jumps out and stabs Trudy in the chest with the only weapon he's ever shown proficiency in, the hunting knife. It was always a retractable blade in the original three, but this film uses a CG blade instead. I never noticed. A second Ghostface pops out and slits Sherry's throat and then runs away, letting her do a nice dramatic death slide in the corner as we're left wondering why neither of these actors were well-known stars. Kind of breaking the trend there, aren't you, Scream 4? Well, not actually, because it turns out that this is Stab 6. That's right, none of that was real. But movies aren't real in general, so I'm still putting those kills on my list. Watching Stab 6 are Rachel and Chloe, who are played by two actors we do know, so that makes us feel a lot more at home in this series. Rachel's not a big fan, though, talking mad shit about Stab. A bunch of articulate teens sit around and deconstruct horror movies until Ghostface kills them one by one. It's been to death. Wait, that sounds a lot like... Oh, Scream 4, you cheeky meta bastard. In either case, Chloe doesn't agree with Rachel, and to prove just how much she loves the stab films, she stabs Rachel in the gut with a knife. Oh, and she does a little twist there too, that's brutal. She stabs Rachel a second time in the same exact spot, just to show that Kristen Bell don't fuck around. Forget what you heard about Anna. And then, wait, what? That was Stab 7? They watched Stab 6 in the beginning of Stab 7? What the fuck? Now that I don't know who or what to trust in this movie, it's hard for me to take these two new chicks seriously. But Jenny tells Marnie that they live in Woodsboro, so, so I guess I should take her word for it? Or maybe I shouldn't, since Marnie gets a phone call and it turns out it's just Jenny fucking with her. The convo's cut short after Marnie yells out over the phone, and Jenny comes downstairs to find her phone on the floor and the lights out. Spooky scary. Marnie's body then flies through the window, giving us our first quote-unquote real kill in the movie. Looks like she was stabbed in the gut? I mean, that's a pretty safe bet. It's kind of the only thing Ghostface does. He pops in to say hello and chases Jenny up the stairs, but since she doesn't keep bicycles on her staircase, like any self-respecting horror film heroine, he manages to catch up with her and stab her in the back. She crawls away, but before she can get out of the garage, he crushes her with the door in an homage to Tatum's death in the original. He finally puts a real end to the real opening sequence of this movie with a trademark knife slash. At this point, I'm still so shook from those fake-out beginnings that I'm half expecting Wes Craven to take off the ghost face mask, flip me the bird, and thank me for my money. But no, we're in it for real now. In fact, we're back in Woodsboro, where there's ghost faces hanging everywhere in very poor taste. Sydney's here too, but she's just visiting, kicking off a book signing tour for her written experience of the Scream situation. Dewey, on the other hand, lives here and has finally become sheriff. He's got a deputy of his own now, Deputy Judy, and she definitely wants to get down and dirty with the Dooster. You're not cheating on your wife if you eat my lemon square. Yeah, maybe not technically, but I've seen Gal in action enough times to know I wouldn't want to be on her bad side. Even if she is having a hard time of it lately, bored as hell in Woodsboro, quietly envious of Sydney's success and experiencing a nasty bout of writer's block. But this is the old guard. We're here to talk reboots and new ideas and youths. Youths like Sydney's cousin Jill. She's headed to school with her friends, the cool-ass Kirby played expertly by Hayden Panettiere, and this chick Olivia, who happens to live next door to Jill. Jill gets a call from Ghostface, and he asks her the same old question. What's your favorite scary movie? So actually, I guess you can forget what I said about fresh ideas. They get to school and talk to these weird-looking cinema club nerds, Robbie and Charlie. Robbie looks weird because he has a little headset webcam thing that he uses to live stream 24-7. How does he afford that bandwidth? And Charlie looks weird because he's played by a Culkin. We also meet Jill's boyfriend. She's mad at him because plot reasons. Dude has no personality, so don't feel bad if you lose him in the white bread section of the grocery store. At Sydney's book signing, she reunites with Gal and Dewey, a round of hugs on the house. But when Dewey and Judy call the phone involved in last night's murders, it's discovered in the trunk 
of Sydney's rental car along with a knife and some bloody pictures. The police get down to business doing what will surely be an inept investigation, and although Gail wants to help, Deputy Judy pulls a power move and doesn't let her. This causes a bit of marital strife between Gooey. Can that be their couple name, Gooey? When Dewey refuses to budge, Gail decides to go rogue and get back to journalism so she can get her groove back. Oh, and Anthony Anderson is here. Hold tight, dude. Blackish is just a few years in your future. That night, Sydney goes to hang out at Jill's house along with Jill's mom, Kate, which would be Maureen's sister, right? Her mom was my sister. Right. Boyfriend guy appears in Jill's room, freaking her out a bit and giving Sydney some serious Billy Loomis vibes when she walks in on them. She says goodnight to Jill, and on her way to bed, Judy comes out of the shadows to get real creepy with Sydney, telling her that they went to high school together and that she always noticed Sid, even if Sydney never noticed her. I know this is a classic scream move to make everyone look suspicious. Everybody's a suspect! Yeah, Randy, I know, all right? But I just feel like in this movie and the last one, the writers went out of their way to make a bunch of characters weird red herrings. Cause yeah, spoiler alert, Judy's not the killer. Also not the killer are these two cops who are staking out Jill's house to keep an eye on Sydney. Anthony Anderson's character Perkins is a little pervy though. She can live next door to me. Dude, we just saw that chick come home from high school. She is a high school girl. You're like 40. Doesn't stop the movie from giving us a gratuitous bra shot, though, when Jill calls Olivia to do a crappy ghost face impression. What's your favorite scary movie, Olivia? While Jill is chatting with Olivia on Kirby's phone, Jill's phone gets a call and Kirby answers it. She thinks it's boyfriend guy, but turns out it's Ghostface, who says he's hiding in the closet. But when they open it, they find it empty, because, as you may have guessed, Ghostface was talking about Olivia's closet. He jumps out and Jill and Kirby see the attack from their bedroom window. Olivia gets stabbed straight through the hand and kicked into a table. Then Ghostface throws her around the room a bit before stabbing her in the back and throwing her on the bed. He goes to town on her stomach with his knife before finally tossing her through a window just for good measure. It's a decently bloody kill that takes it up a notch when Sydney comes next door to find Olivia's body with her insides on the outside. Ghostface attacks Sydney and Jill, landing a slash on Jill's arm, but Sydney fights back like always. Also like always, Ghostface disappears as the cops arrive. And some more like always, the suspicious boyfriend shows up right after Ghostface is gone. Scream has a playbook, and Coach Craven does not stray from those plays. Over at the hospital, Robbie and Charlie are doing their little stream thing when Gal confronts them, asking to team up to figure this whole thing out. They agree, mostly because Robbie wants to take a trip to Cougar Town. I love you. So going forward, we'll have a nice alliance between new and, uh, well, media of a certain age. Inside the hospital, Sydney fires her book agent, Rebecca Walters, because she is like Scream 1 Gal Weathers level nasty. Two girls butchered. <laughs> Payday. Rebecca pouts her way out to the parking garage, talking to herself like a goddamn crazy person. Just call me and apologize. Before her soliloquy is interrupted by a phone call. Guess who it is? It's Ghostface. When she tries to run back inside for safety, she discovers that Ghostface has somehow locked the door and also made that handle super weak. So she's trapped against a wall when he storms her and stabs her in the gut. She takes a while to slide down against the wall and die. And if she wasn't fully dead then, she definitely is after Ghostface chucks her from the building and she crashes into this news van. Yeah, go ahead and check for a pulse there, Mountain Dewey. I'm thinking she left it four stories up. The next night, there's a stab movie marathon that Jill's not allowed to go to, so she stays home and chats with Sydney about what it's like being a final girl. Kirby goes to the Stabathon though, because I guess this city doesn't care about highly publicized parties where high schoolers go to get drunk. I do enjoy the people dressing like Dewey and Gal though. Real Gal's also there, slipping into a ghost face mask to pull her tried and true hidden camera trick, putting a number of webcams all over the party barn. When she gets to her car and starts logging though, she watches as her webcams get covered up by a g g g g g ghost face. She heads back inside because she's just gotta get that drunk high schooler footage, yo. And then she finds a second camera not set up by her. Ghostface comes from behind and attacks her, successfully stabbing her in the shoulder. But Dewey shows up and shoots Ghostface away, and Gal looks like she'll be just fine, because there's no way this franchise has the guts to kill off Courtney Cox. While doing a perimeter check, Officer Haas notices that Jill's window is open. When he goes back to Officer Perkins to relay the information, Ghostface runs up and stabs Haas in the back. It's a simple kill, like most of these are, and all it does is leave me wondering why they wasted Adam Brody in a two-bit cop part that got killed so unceremoniously. And you're probably like, dude, they're wasting Anthony Anderson too, and you're right, to some degree. I mean, he is the next one dead when Ghostface stabs him in the forehead. But check it. Ghostface takes the knife out and Perkins gets out of the car. Bleeding from his fucking brain, he wobbles around for a little bit, blinded by blood, but still swinging a few punches before finally falling down to his death. This may seem improbable, but Craven based it on a real life incident and I think it's freaking great. Inside the house, Sid is all jumpy and gets scared by Kate, coming home from a grocery run at the most suspicious hour possible. This is the kind of shit I'm talking about. Why would she be shopping right now? Whatever. The phone rings and Sydney 
completely answers it. And yeah, of course it's Ghostface. Hey Sid, maybe try not answering the phone sometime, huh? Maybe just let the machine get the next one. Ghostface threatens her family, so she runs upstairs and finds Jill has flown the coop, apparently picked up by Kirby to head to that party. When Sid and Kate try to peace out, they're attacked by Ghostface, who they successfully lock out of the house, but Ghostface still manages to stab Kate in the back through the mail slot. Man, mail slots and landline phones? This may be a modern upgrade to the franchise, but part of it's always gonna be stuck in the 90s. Judy shows up, but Sid doesn't trust her, so she GTFOs to go find Jill. Jill's chilling with Charlie and Robbie at Kirby's house. And hey, look who's here, the, uh, uh, the boyfriend, uh, character guy. He claims Jill texted him to come over, but she says no, 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 she ain't got her phone. She leaves the room to go get it, with boyfriend guy leaving shortly after. Because whodunits only work when characters are split up and in constant motion. Charlie and Kirby continue their movie marathon and go to make out before boyfriend guy interrupts them. Thanks, dude. Just because you can't get any doesn't mean you got a cock block. Charlie storms off with blue balls, while Hayden Panettiere sits on the couch and does some amazing face acting, solidifying herself as the most enjoyable new person in the cast. Get out of my house! Meanwhile, Robbie's out back drunkenly vlogging when Ghostface comes out of the house and stabs him in the chest. He tries to run away, but Ghostface catches up to him, getting him once more in the back and knocking him to the ground. Robbie tries a bullshit excuse to survive. You can't, there's rules. I, I, I'm gay. I'm gay. But it doesn't work, because obviously. Ghostface stabs him once more, and Robbie ends up stumbling to his death on the front porch. I don't know where they came up with the whole gay people live in reboots thing, but it seemed pretty forced. Right before Robbie died, Sydney showed up, so she, Jill, and Kirby are now on the run from Ghostface. Jill hides underneath the bed upstairs, while Sydney and Kirby end up running into the basement. Charlie shows up outside the basement patio door, but Sydney admonishes Kirby not to let him in if she can't trust him. So he's left out in the cold as Ghostface attacks him, and then, as Sydney and Kirby watch, the screen cuts to black. Was that supposed to be him turning off the lights? Like, what lights? He made it pitch black? Nah, man, that was a simple editing cut, and it feels real cheap there. The lights come back up, aka the editor dissolves back into a shot, and Charlie's tied up in a very Orthian fashion. Sydney runs off to try to take care of business, while Kirby plays Ghostface's trivia game. She thinks that she answered his brain buster correctly, so she goes outside and unties Charlie, so everything's great, right? Wrong! Charlie fucking stabs her in the stomach, cause Charlie's a ghost face! Oh, shit! Charlie gives her his reason. Four years of classes together, you notice me now? Showing he's just one of those classic whiny nice guys. Then he stabs her again and tosses her body down to the ground. Interestingly enough, Wes Craven himself said Kirby was a possible survivor, but in light of his passing and my hopes that they won't continue the franchise without him, I'm just gonna add her to our list. Back inside, Charlie attacks Sid and holds a knife to her throat. She gets away, but then another ghost face stabs her in the gut. Any guesses on who it is? Anyone? Last chance. It's Jill. I saw it coming, but maybe it was a fun twist for you. Jill and Charlie have been recording all their kills and they're gonna upload them and make them traceable to Boyfriend Guy, who they're planning on framing because, you know, framing someone is just part of the Scream handbook. And we do not stray from the handbook when making a Scream. Jill finally ends Boyfriend Guy's boyfriend life by shooting him in his boyfriend dick. Ouch, that's got a boyfriend hurt. Then she puts one in his head, making our 13th kill, uh, sorry, what was it again, man? Travis? Travy? Whatever. Boyfriend Guy. Charlie and Jill are getting really into the whole reboot angle. And we're the innocent victims, Sydney and Randy. Their whole thing is that they want to be famous, and they think survival surviving a murder spree that people have seen video footage of will make them America's darlings or some shit. Charlie, hate to break it to you, you're never gonna be anyone's darling. That is not a happy Jill face. To pay even more homage to the original movies, Charlie and Jill bring back the classic Billy Stu stabby stab fun times to make themselves look like victims. Charlie psychs himself up to get stabbed in the shoulder, but Jill ain't playing around, and she stabs Charlie straight in the heart. Turns out her plan is to make Charlie seem like one of the killers after all and be famous all on her own. Tough break, Charlie, but for someone so well steeped in the mythos of these movies, you should have known the second fiddle villain always gets backstabbed. Jill stabs Sid in the gut again and she falls down, and I actually thought maybe they killed her, but nope, they didn't. Spoiler. Then Jill goes around methodically making herself look like a survivor, and it's kind of fun to watch. She scratches her face and pulls out her hair with boyfriend's hand, then stabs herself against the wall with the knife. As if that wasn't enough, she smashes her head against a picture and fucking stage dives into a glass table, before finally collapsing next to Sydney for a really nice Facebook cover photo. Dewey and Judy finally arrive, seeing all the carnage and getting take your hat off level sad. Jill is carted out on a stretcher where she gets a taste of the adoration and fame she's always wanted. But she comes off her high in the hospital when the Doomeister drops this bombshell on her. They think Sydney just might make it. He leaves her bedside, and Jill wastes no time sneaking into Sydney's room to finish the job. And because this is Scream, she has to make a horror movie reference as she does it. Who are you, Michael fucking Myers? They wrestle around the hospital room for a little while, Jill being a real bee and punching Sid in her gut wound. And when Dewey rushes in to save her, he gets a fucking beat down from Jill with a bedpan. Wow, he gets his ass whooped. Just be thankful it was empty, dude. Gail and Judy both show up, but Jill holds them off at gunpoint, even shooting Judy just for shits and gigs. But while Gail distracts her, Sydney grabs the defibrillators and 
and starts charging him up. Gail yes ands her and sets Sydney up for a punchline. Clear. 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 Joe gets 360 jewels to the fucking dome and collapses onto the floor. I know Joe's pretty dead right there, but she is smoking. No, literally, there's smoke coming off of her. Don't call me an Axel. Besides, she's not even really dead. She grabs a shard of glass and comes behind Sydney for one last attack, but Sydney shoots her by now a seasoned veteran of the killer's last hurrah that these movies just love to comment on. Part of the playbook. Sydney lies down next to Jill in a cute mirror version of that earlier shot, with Jill the dead one this time, our 15th and final victim. Yep, just 15, because Judy's still alive. I know, you were so worried about her, right? Outside, the reporters give Jill the praise she fought and killed for, not knowing that she's dead and also, you know, a murderer. An ironic ending. Perfect for an ironic series that was always commenting on itself. And now's the part where I exit the frame in a silly way to do the numbers. Or do I? I do. Fifteen people died in Scream 4, significantly more than any of the original trilogy, even though three of the kills were fictional characters. In a kill count first, more women were killed than men, with ten of the victims female and only five of them male. A pretty stark gender imbalance, though again, three of those were in-movie characters. With a runtime of 110 minutes, Scream 4 had a kill on average every 7.3 minutes, by far the most frequent of the series. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest death to Officer Perkins. Olivia almost took it with her display of intestinal fortitude, but I'm a sucker for reality that's stranger than fiction, and the fact that this happened in real life makes it way more powerful to me. Dol Machete for lamest kill is gonna go to Perkins' partner Hoss. A single stab to the back put that guy down, and that's just a waste of a death. And there you have it, another series wrapped on the kill count with the conclusion of Scream 4. I liked it a lot more than Scream 3, but it still felt like it was more of a cliché than it was a commentary on clichés. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything on this channel, because I'll be back next week with an all-new body count for you. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Hey guys, thanks a lot for watching The Kill Count for Scream 4. We're done with another series, and this one did not take me three months to do. I know Scream isn't as hardcore of a series as Friday or some other picks, but it's still a really important franchise in the genre, so maybe don't be dicks about it. I'll have something new for you next week, so make sure you come back. See you then.